I'm Amber Payne, publisher and general manager of The Emancipator. I want to tell you a quick story. It's the story of how a single, powerful, anti-racist idea can be unleashed to create transformative change. In 2016, historian Ibram X. Kendi released a book called Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. But he didn't stop there. He knew he'd have to master the art of storytelling to confront racial injustice. Since then, he's created baby board books, graphic novels, anthologies, podcasts, TV shows, and a Netflix documentary. But there's more to this story. In 2021, I connected with Amber Payne about an idea. Amber was well established at carving out space for black stories in legacy media. She founded NBC Black in 2014 and continued her mission to uplift the stories of marginalized communities at Teen Vogue, BET, and on a journalism fellowship at Harvard in 2020. During that same summer, in the midst of the so-called racial reckoning, on the other side of the Charles River, Ibram founded the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University and began reimagining the first abolitionist newspaper for a new day, The Emancipator. The Emancipator is a digital magazine explaining and exploring solutions that can deconstruct racism. Just as two centuries ago, abolitionist newspapers explained and explored solutions that could and did deconstruct slavery. And that's how you turn a single idea into a movement. Thank you so much. Hey there, South by Southwest. How are you guys doing today, this morning? All right. How you feeling, Abram? I'm good. I'm feeling good. Yes. Well, thank you all so much for being here, um, for all your support. We are here to talk about so storytelling for social impact and social change. And um, I thought, who better to talk to than you, Ibram, on that? But I know we have a lot of creators and um, entrepreneurs in the audience, and we're really talking about story and connecting about story. And you know, stories shape our thoughts. They shape our memories. Um, they extend generations, uh, they're passed down, they're handed down, and they really connect us, and they can be collaborative. So I think, I know we both feel really passionately about the power of storytelling, and I'm, I'm, but I am curious, for a show of hands, how many of you in the audience, raise your hand, do you consider yourself a storyteller? Okay, amazing, right. uh, really like the majority of the room. Um, but you know, I think we, we know you don't have to be a journalist or um, an award-winning author to, to be a storyteller. Uh, it really shows up in, in what we do in our, in our work in everyday life, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. But I wanted to start, Ibram, about asking you about your storytelling journey. So how did you learn to tell a story? Mm. <laughs> so I feel like I'm still learning how to tell a story, but I would say really probably my, my, both my parents were ministers um, and still are ministers. And every other Sunday I would see them stand up in front of people and, and not only sort of convey a message from the Bible, but, but typically convey it in story form and, and I think that was, for, for me, the origins, because it, 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 it was this sort of bringing together of trying to convey an idea, but the vehicle being a story, uh, and sort of seeing the power of that. Uh, and, and so in certain types of ways, I do something similar just in a secular form. Yeah, I, I, can, I can also relate to that. Um, listening to Bible dramas on tape to fall asleep <laughs> yes. is what I would do growing up. And you know, thinking about the metaphors and parallels, uh, parables in, in the Bible, I can um, relate to that as a storytelling vehicle. So how did you move, we're skipping ahead here, but how did you move from, from, from reading about race and racism, um, conducting scholarship on it, to writing books about it? There were a number of 
books that were just incredibly transformative uh, for me during the course of, of my own personal and intellectual journey. And, and the more books that I read, the more books I wanted to read but didn't exist. Um, and, and I think the more I sort of searched for those books and, and found that they didn't exist, the more I was hoping somebody else would write them, uh, and, and the more um, I realized that that probably wasn't going to be the case, the more I realized that, that I had to write it myself. Um, and, and, and so really, it was really searching for books and not finding those, searching for stories and not finding those. And, 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 but then I think it's also for me, I can always, I can tell when there's a book in me because it's something that I continuously talk about. Uh, it's something that I'm continuously passionate about. It, it's something that I'm interested in learning more about. Um, and, and so once I realized that, okay, you know what, I need to, <laughs> I need to sort of get this out you know, in book form, and I can even see that in other people. You know, I suspect each of you, people close to you know of a book <laughs> uh, that, that you have been dancing around probably for years, um, because I think we all have a book in us. Right, and if, if you're thinking about it, there must be someone else there that is looking for it. Exactly. Um, you wrote How to Be, Anti be Anti-Racist, which I'm sure many people in the room are familiar with and have read, and it really is your personal narrative and your personal journey um, around race and racism and racist ideas and kind of confronting things within yourself. And that was a unique form of storytelling because you're bringing in scholarship, but also you're almost a memoir approach to it. So can you talk a little bit about that, the approach to that book, why you, why you wrote it in that way, who you hope to reach with that? So once I, I realized, or I should say, forced myself to write this book that I didn't want to write, um, I, I Why? Also, Wait a second. Why didn't you want to write it? Because I knew it would be incredibly controversial. Mm. I, I knew that it would be deeply personal, and whether that personal was me or personal was, was, was hopefully someone who I could sort of chronicle their own individual journey. Uh, I knew that, um, that human beings across the world commonly self-identify as not racist. Mm -hmm. And so to write a book that makes the case that there's no such thing as not racist, uh, I knew that would probably be a number of people, billions probably, who, maybe, who maybe would have few. issues maybe uh, few. You know, with that. Um, and, and so, I, so the, I mean, the, and that's just the sort of scratching the surface. Um, and, and also when you're, when you're challenging both those who, you, when you're challenging uh, both racism and even popular conceptions of racism simultaneously, you'll probably get it from all sides, and I, and I have. I know, <laughs> for real. Um, with that book, though, you also, um, I'm wondering about the pushback as well, because I think there are people also in this room who they want to be vulnerable, they want to tell their story, but they're also afraid, maybe reserved, maybe introverted, more reflective, um, and probably can just relate to you know, pulling something from within to, to really go there. So do you have any um, advice for anybody in that camp on how to actually really excavate your story, your personal story? Well, I think first, I think to, to even answer the question that you had originally asked, I, I realized that being anti-racist was a journey, was a, a really a long and consistent conceptual sort of journey of, of learning and unlearning. And, and I did not feel that I could write this book without being in someone's head, without chronicling someone's journey. And I, fortunately, I couldn't find another head that I could get into, you know, other than other than my own. Uh, and so that's why I ultimately decided to to use my own personal story as as sort of that anchor. But it was incredibly hard. It literally took me um, a year 
of writing the first five chapters. Yeah. And I, I typically write much faster than that because the bulk of the time that I spend producing books on researching and sort of thinking about how I'm going or what I'm going to say. And it wasn't really until I, you know, to be frank, it wasn't really until I was, I was diagnosed with, with stage four colon cancer. Uh, and, and then I decided I wanted to come finish this book mm. before something happened to me that all of the anxiety, all of the fear, uh, just sort of washed away because in my mind, I wasn't even gonna live to see mm -hmm. this book come out. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm saying that to say, I, didn't, I, I did not, while I was writing the book, figure out a way to be vulnerable <laughs> uh, as much as I almost uh, had the opportunity, I think that sort of, disease in a way allowed me to become vulnerable and to allow me to reach a level of, mm -hmm. of vulnerability and, and self-criticism that I don't think I would have been able mm -hmm. to reach uh, without that, that diagnosis. But I think since then, you know, I, I've, I have personally realized that we as human beings are we, we, we learn quite effectively when other human beings are willing to be self-reflective. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. instead of them lecturing to us, we witness their self-reflection, which then allows us to be self-reflective. So that ability for us to be vulnerable with ourselves publicly mm -hmm. uh, allows other people to be vulnerable with themselves privately, which then allows transformative change. Wow. Yeah, it really helps to, someone to unlock that piece. And since then, you've written, is it, is it 16 books? How many books are we on? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> who, who knows? You've got more books coming. Um, Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas. It was a, a National Book Award winning book. And, um, you know, that was a book that, as you saw from the video, I mean, you've really found a way to. Uh, deliver that message to many different audiences. Can you talk about the medium and how the medium, the balance between the medium and the message and how you've, you've pulled that through with Stamped, an example? So after writing Stamped from the beginning, which I recognized when, I, when, I, when it came out first in, in 2016, it was over 500 pages. Uh, of course, it was a, it was a narrative history, but many people just do not have the time or even the interest to sit down and, and, and read a, a five or 600 page book. But to me, the story in the book, mm -hmm. allowing people to understand not only anti-black racist ideas, but literally who created them, who produced them, why they produced them, how they've transformed over time, how they're shaping our world, is, is a story, is a history, is a piece of scholarship that I think is beneficial for everyone. So I think after that book came out, we started thinking about ways to deliver the same history just in different forms, in, 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 in forms that people are actually right. sort of receiving. And so that's why we ended up transforming it for sort of young people, and I worked with children's book authors to, mm -hmm. to transform it for a YA audience, a middle grade audience. We did a graphic novel. We, of course, did, did the film stamp from the beginning so that no matter how a person consumes history, no matter how a person consumes information, they could still get access to this history that they keep trying to ban. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I, I want to call out Stamp from the Beginning, the documentary on Netflix, if you all haven't seen it. Um, even as a documentary, it is so compelling because of the different uh, graphic depictions and somehow y'all took that 500 page book and really put it into this 90 minute documentary highlighting particular themes um, and hearing from black women historians. And um, I think that's just a great example of really transforming that one message into something completely different, but, but still, um, in harmony. Well, I think part of this is when we have 
a, a serious and impactful idea to share, it becomes just as important mm -hmm. for us to figure out and to take a tremendous amount of care in figuring out how we're going to deliver that idea to the public. And I think, unfortunately, too often we, got, we get so caught up in uh, thinking about how we're gonna deliver the idea mm -hmm. and, and ensuring that it's layered and complex as it should be, and not necessarily thinking about the receiver. Uh, and, and, and so that's one of the things that I've been encouraging myself to do and I'm certainly encouraging others to do that it's so critically important uh, that when we have these impactful ideas for us to ensure that we're figuring out a way <laughs> to make them as accessible as possible. The more important the idea, the more accessible you know, it should be. Yeah, and in that same vein, we, we, we had this talk over breakfast with our friend. How do you change someone? Or maybe how do you change someone's mind? is one question that we have as storytellers. What have you found is a bit behind maybe the psychology of that, at least in the way that you're doing the work you're doing? So I've, grow, I've grown up around a number of strong-willed people who you don't change their minds. <laughs> now they can change their own minds. Uh, but I think, so for me, I, I think creating space, uh, creating conditions, then that can be conceptual conditions uh, in which a person decides that they're going to change their minds for themselves. Uh, and, 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 and I think that becomes absolutely critical. So I think in the case of how to be an anti-racist, what people have told me is that them witnessing me uh, sort of acknowledge the ways in which I was trafficking in anti-blackness as opposed to me lecturing them that they should not be trafficking in anti-blackness, I think led people to, to decide for themselves that, hey, maybe I'm, I'm doing this too. <laughs> you know, maybe I should change. Um, and I, I wonder if I would have written a, a, you know, a more traditional book in which I just was sort of documenting how people are being racist and how they should be anti-racist uh, without the sort of personal narrative that that, that, would, that, that I think people would have probably uh, not had as much space to decide for themselves that they're going to transform themselves. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, and by the way, we're getting some really good questions. Please keep sending them through. I'll start to weave them into the conversation. Um, I do wanna... Well, and I have some questions. Well, I, okay, okay, if, okay. If I know, okay. I know, I know. All right, <laughs> so, all right, Take, t turn the tables so, on me. <laughs> so, you know, Amber, it's interesting because, you know, you, you went from being this incredibly successful uh, television news producer, executive, um, to now sort of publishing this, this tiny anti-racist startup. Like, how and why, <laughs> uh, you know, did this, did this happen? Well, I think for me, it was a progression. I, was, uh, I came up at NBC Nightly News, worked my way up to be a producer there, and um, working on any, any story that was happening, um, whatever the news of the day was, and always, but then I realized my, my interest and my role there as one of the few black producers and black women producers um, feeling this responsibility. There was a meeting where my executive producer called on me Amber, what do you think? And it was a black story. And I felt offended by that <laughs> and said, well, what? She's just, she's just asking me because I'm, I'm the only black person in this room. And then sort of flipping that in my head and saying, okay, but that's actually my responsibility here. If I don't say anything, if I don't know the story, then you know, this person next to me who doesn't have this lived experience is gonna be the one you know, in charge of taking that story to the finish line. And there are, just, there are things that I can really bring to the table um, that can be relatable. And, and so that sort of be, had became my tra trajectory after leaving NBC um, Nightly News and founding NBC BLK and going to Teen Vogue and other places where I was really looking for these marginalized stories and communities to, to bring them out. And, and even in my year on a journalism fellowship, I was trying to examine, well, how do you get through the echo chamber? How do you break through the bubble on, um, we're always preaching to the choir, you know, 
we're always, it's the same people who are, are celebrating what we're working on and how do you actually cut through to those people who, maybe they're not on the far right, but they're, you know, maybe they're on the cusp. There's somebody that you, they, you might be able to change their mind or heart or something. And so that's just how I, when I heard about the Emancipator and this opportunity to reimagine the first abolitionist newspaper, these, these 19th century papers, which, um, as you know, well know the history, they were uh, a catalyst. They were, you know, fundamental in, in changing people's minds and showing people that there was humanity, um, you know, after slavery, like there was possibility. Yeah. So really like imagining your future, um, radical future. And I'm very interested in that, in, in finding communities and solutions um, and bringing those out because that can be shared amongst us. You don't need to go into um, the highest level of government or, or academia to find a solution. You can go to the community. Yeah. And so I'm, that's really what, I, what attracted me to this little startup <laughs> the, uh, and the ability to really create something new and have something be collaborative and bring that energy. It's interesting because when these anti-slavery and abolitionist newspapers were, were first being founded literally two centuries ago in the 1820s, it was inconceivable for most Americans that one day chattel slavery would be abolished. Uh, just as today, I think it's inconceivable mm -hmm. for most Americans that let's say one day the structure of racism could, could be abolished. Um, yeah. But with those abolitionists, creating and imagining that story was, 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 was absolutely critical. And so what's the, sort of, what's the significance of storytelling with The Emancipator? Oh, it's, uh, it's critical. I mean, we were really founded um, starting with commentary and this mm -hmm. idea that an evidence-based argument can be presented and can change your mind and give you something to think about. I think one of my goals with the Emancipator is just having, um, arming, arming the community, arming people to be able to um, show up at their PTO meeting and um, maybe push back on book bans or something else in this swirling culture wars, um, to be able to have that conversation with their neighbor um, or their dad <laughs> or their family member um, about uh, race and racism and um, partly educating, but also presenting our stories in a way that's shareable. Yeah. We have to meet people where they are. Um, I'm sure everyone. I'm sure everyone in this room. You, you you get your you get you get your news on social media. You might have your apps, but are you logging into Instagram and scrolling through? You know, we have a social first storytelling approach where we're not the day one story. We're not the breaking news story, but we will give you. Um, we will give you something on social that is understandable, shareable, and we'll go deeper a couple days later on a story. So we have um, a lot of mechanisms that we're trying to deploy, including uh, community engagement. You know, we have developed these solution circles as a practice that we're, we're doing, bringing together people in the community. We held one on black and brown mothers and breastfeeding and, and bringing them together to talk to us, well, what are the solutions you need? in your community? What are your challenges? Let's literally put a post-it on the wall and, and write it down and put it up there. And let's, as a journalist, we are gonna take that back and we're reporting that out because you're an expert. We don't have to go and call, um, you know, some, somebody at BU, <laughs> Harvard, to ask them what, how do we solve, you know, breastfeeding disparities. We can talk to people about this. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also just part of, part of our approach of, of of uh, building community and asset framing. You know, this is a, a concept um, that uh, social entrepreneur Trabian Shorters really has talked a lot about and developed as far as defining communities by their aspirations instead of defining them, uh, starting with them as, at their deficit level. Yeah. So those are some of the practices of storytelling that we try to deploy. So since we have many, many storytellers in this room, I, I suspect many of you uh, realize that there's a lot of people telling stories today. 
there's a lot of mediums for, for telling stories. Uh, and, and certainly as it relates to, to journalism, there are a whole bunch of sort of news outlets, uh, print, digital, everything in between. And so, you know, how are you ensuring that the emancipator sort of stands out? What I think is what is a distinct, what are some of the distinguishing factors uh, of the emancipator within this sort of media ecosystem? Yeah, well, you know, our, our real guiding point is we are exploring and explaining solutions to racial inequity. And this is what we do all day, every day. You may have your outlets and your journalists that you follow who, you know, oh yeah, they write on equity and like every couple months or every other month or there's a, there's a weekly newsletter. Um, and I follow all of them and I love them. But, you know, this is something that we are putting at the forefront because racial uh, inequity shows up across every sector and it needs to be um, covered very deeply and tightly and closely. And so, you know, for one, we're showing up all day, every day on purpose uh, to do this work. And I guess, how can folks check out The Emancipator? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, I was, uh, you wrote, funny you should ask. Well, we do have a big announcement to make. We haven't actually shared this publicly yet, and we wanted to do it here for the South by audience, but we have just relaunched our website, www.theemancipator.org, and it, uh, we, just, we just redid it. We used to be a collaboration between the Boston Globe and Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research, and um, so we're excited to unveil that, and please, it's okay to look down at your phone right now and go on and break, break the website, break the internet, um, and follow us on social. So this is, I think, like, this is a new chapter for us, yes. and listen, storytelling also, it shows up on uh, technology and visuals and data, and so we're, we're excited and, follow the QR code, follow us. Um, so that's, that's our, our, our little news we wanted to share today. Yeah, and also, I also think here in Texas, uh, in particular, um, this is certainly one of the places in which people are fighting on the front lines uh, against yeah. racism. Um, and I think to sort of unveil this website here, um, I, I know there's a U.S. senator in this state that may not like it, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or even a governor. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who brought one of your uh, baby board books to a Senate hearing? <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, that guy. Um, <laughs> And but he didn't read it. Like, he didn't I mean, even, yeah. And it's not that long. I've, I mean, I've read it to my five-year-old. Um, but I think, but what, but I want to get back to, um, you know, we're talking about the emancipator and these abolitionists, the, the abolitionist tradition and, and carrying that forward and that, that level of storytelling. And you wrote about this, about William Lloyd Garrison, who was the founder of the Liberator. And I, I just wanted to get another, um, hear from you a little bit more on just, the social impact of these abolitionist papers and, and, and what's your perspective on, on how we've reinvented them 200 years later? So I think going back to the 1820s, there was a lot of confusion around slavery. Um, and I think one of the ways in which I think these abolitionist newspapers made a important impact that I think it's maybe difficult for us to, to know being on the other side of that impact is they clarified for people both the problem mm. <laughs> and the solution, both who was reinforcing the problem and who was working towards that solution. And, and I think similarly today, you, you have people who would say that racial disparities and inequities are not a problem. Or they, if they are a problem, they demonstrate what's wrong with, let's say, people of color. Uh, so 
just as you had people two centuries ago who said, why would there be something wrong with slavery? It's actually good for the nation. You, you literally had people arguing this sort of positive good theory, uh, making the case that, let's say, uh, American slavery was better for black people than, quote, African barbarism. Uh, you, you had people claiming uh, that, uh, that, that black people should be uh, slave, you know, enslaved. Uh, similarly, just as you have people claiming today that, that, that black and brown people should be overrepresented in prisons mm -hmm. because they're so dangerous and violent. Right. Uh, and so I think there are all these sort of parallels in which you, you have these ideas and stories and narratives that are confusing many people, that are causing people to see the victims of racism as the problems. And I think two centuries ago, it was abolitionist newspapers and periodicals who clarified uh, both the problem and, and the solution, such that by the time of the Civil War, three decades and thousands of articles and hundreds of anti-slavery newspapers later, a tremendous number of Americans were no longer able to be manipulated by enslavers, you know, into thinking that somehow slavery was good for them or good for the nation or even good for, for black people. And, and that's one of the things I'm hoping we, we do with yeah. the emancipator, that, that a tremendous number of Americans realize racism isn't good for them, it's not good for their nation, it's certainly not good uh, for, for its victims. Absolutely. Let's clap it up for that. And I think of the emancipator, um, I think of emancipation on different levels. Emancipation from misinformation, yeah. emancipation from disinformation, emancipation from ignorance, bigotry, hatred. It's a whole, there's a whole other level that we're facing right now. But there are parallels, right? You're talking about how people were saying slavery was good for the nation. So there's kind of a, a chaos of storytelling as well, kind of um, mm -hmm. a storytelling that is dangerous, that is harmful. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the tenets of that, the tenets of that now? Because I think that is one of the most dangerous issues that we're looking at right now, this, this misinformation and these twisted narratives. So, you know, what are you seeing in these, in these twisted narratives of storytelling and how do you combat those? How do we disrupt those? Man, how much time we have? Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're certainly, uh, so let me just give two examples. Uh, the, the term freedom, you know, and the term equity. So in the, in the case of the term freedom, there's, there, there's a widespread debate, uh, and there are largely two conceptions of freedom. There, there, there are many people with quite powerful platforms uh, who are manipulating people into believing that, they, that if they do not have the freedom to force women to give birth, if, if they do not have the freedom uh, to oppress people, to exploit people, uh, if they do not have the, quote, freedom uh, to harm people, uh, then, then, quote, the nation is going awry. <laughs> right. Because that, for them, is freedom. <laughs> they want the freedom, like the enslaver, to enslave. And literally, enslavers, abol they saw abolitionists as taking away their freedoms. Mm -hmm. You know, similarly, just like you have today, those who are trying to entrench and maintain different forms of bigotry, and those of us who are fighting against them, they're claiming that we are taking away their freedom. So there's this debate over the concept of freedom, and, and, and what I would argue is that there are those who, who, who are demanding the freedom to, meaning mm -hmm. the freedom to oppress, the freedom to enslave, the freedom to impoverish, the freedom to kill, and then there are those who are fighting for the freedom from killing, from oppression, right? You know, from slavery. And, and I think we have to be clear on what type of freedom we should be demanding and asking for and trying to sort of create. And then the second idea 
that I want to mention very quickly is the whole notion that somehow equity or striving for equity is harmful, mm -hmm. somehow harmful to, let's say, white people. Right. That, that, that th this notion that there's this zero sum uh, society in which if we somehow create more opportunities for one group, that it's going to quote, take opportunities away from another group, uh, that idea is just simply not true. Right. <laughs> I mean, in this state, after the abolition of slavery, not only were enslaved Africans freed, but poor non-slaveholding whites were freed from a state that was dominated by enslavers. <laughs> Uh, you know, when we were able to move against voter suppression policies like poll taxes, that didn't just make it harder for black people to vote, it made it harder for everyone who didn't have money for a poll tax to vote except the super rich. And, and, so I, I don't, and so what happens if you're the super rich, you want people believing uh, that equitable, just policies is going to harm them because then they're going to fight against efforts to undo them, not knowing that they're essentially fighting for their own destruction. Right. And we see that now. Yes. So with that, how do we, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? What do we do with that as storytellers? I think this is where this is where the story comes in. Like, I just told a story, right? I, I, and I think, you know, even when you were talking earlier, and we were talking earlier about, like, how to transform people, how to change mm -hmm. people, part of, you know, what, what also is certainly the case, and studies have shown, that us telling our stories to other people who respect us, who know us, just us sharing our own personal stories is actually transformative. And it's, to me, just as important for, let's say if you are a Latino American who's been subjected to, to racism, for you to share that story with a, a non-Latino person. So, you know, that's, that's important. But it's also important for, let's say, a, a, a white person who have transformed themselves through yeah. reading or through hearing that story about that Latino person to share the story of their own transformation. Yeah. That also is quite powerful. And so I think just telling us sort of sharing our stories, which of course we're going to, we, we, we certainly want to do with the, in the, in the Emancipator, mm -hmm. you know, is, 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 is absolutely, critical, and, and I mean, would you say that that's how storytellers can oh, play their part? Definitely, I think um, finding those mo uh, places of relatability. Yeah. I think about a series we did last year called The Talk. If you've heard of The Talk, The Talk is typically known as the talk that black parents give to their black children to help them keep, keep them safe in the world. You know, here's how you act around the police, here's what you do if you get pulled over. Well, Everybody has their own version of the talk. We started to talk to some of our contributors, and we did a series with you know Chinese American writers, native, um, uh, disabled writers, and a white mother. And she did this video essay. If you go to our YouTube, check it out. Um, a letter to my white sons, talking about what she tells them about white nationalism after having an experience where she saw them scrolling through their phones, liking pictures of. Hitler and white nationalism, you know, ironically, um, and just having that talk with them about the dangers and their responsibility. And I thought, like, that's a really important perspective. You know, we are at the Emancipator, of course, amplifying a lot of um, multiracial uh, perspectives, but having this white mother share literally what she tells her children, um, you know, that kind of messaging is relatable, is shareable, kind of finding these commonalities uh, between groups. I think about just back in the Trayvon Martin days and the moment that that happened, I was at NBC and um, Mara Schiavacombo was a reporter who did a story on just being a black mother and worrying about your children. And the story was so emotional and it was just relatable to anybody who's a mother, number one, and number two, anybody who's a parent. 
Um, and so finding those kinds of stories, because I was actually surprised we were doing that story on the nightly news because, you know, we had sort of been trained about who is our audience and your audience is Martha. You know, what's, think about what my EP literally said. Think about what Martha is gonna, how is her husband, how's, how's Martha gonna come back from the kitchen to come back and sit down after the break? Hey, Martha, come quick. What's that story? <laughs> is kind of a joke my EP would make. He didn't say Martina. <laughs> He didn't mm. say, you know, um, Michelle, it was Martha. And it was a very clear audience and directive. So I think it's also just important to not pigeonhole our audience yeah. and, and give the audience some credit, um, especially when you're working in legacy media or a, a, a corporate entity where you're being told, well, the, no, 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 the, the demographic says this, like, that's not our audience. But you know who the audience is, and you have to push back on that as to how to reach them and with what kind of stories or, or subjects, characters um, can really touch those hearts. Yeah, and oftentimes Martha doesn't even want to hear that story. You know? <laughs> Martha did not want to hear that. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. no, no. <laughs> I guess, should we take some Should questions? we take some questions? Yeah. yeah, there's some really amazing questions here that we're going to start bringing, bringing up. Um, so the first one, how do you measure the impact of storytelling on social change, and what indicators do you look for to gauge effectiveness? How do you measure the impact? Um, you know, as a digital media person, of course, I'm looking at numbers. How many people are reading our stories? How many people are commenting? Um, and what are they saying? And are they sharing this story? And are they... I mean, the story we posted on Daryl George, um, the young man from Texas, here we are, from Texas, in Texas, right, who uh, was persecuted because of his hairstyle. I mean, the number of comments we got on that story showed us this is obviously something we want to do more of. We want to have this exchange with our audience where we're listening to them. That's a signal to us um, that they're, this is important to them and we need to do more uh, coverage like this. And I'd say, you know, gauging effectiveness for us can be a little bit quantitative sometimes, yeah. but it also can be that that one person um, who's 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 actually personally you're personally ex having an exchange with. Um, you're 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 picking up your phone and calling about the Crown Act. Um, you're trying to help change policy in your community or mobilize or stand up for somebody who sits next to you. So it's harder to kind of really granularly measure as a journalist, whether you're impacting someone unless they, they really tell you, unless it's something that really does s trigger you know, policy change. But what do you think about that question? I, I, I agree, and, and, and I would also state that it's typically the case that power and policy shifts uh, are justified or explained through, through narrative shifts. Uh, and narrative shifts are, of course, baked in stories. And so seeing and, and witnessing literally policy changing and, and the relationship between those changes and, you know, and stories, I, I think is another way in which we could measure the impact. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give this one to you because this is an interesting one. You mentioned that we all consume history differently. If you can describe the state of racial inequity today using a food allergy, food analogy, sorry, I have food allergies. <laughs> Peanuts and tree nuts, um, for the record. If you can describe the state of racial inequity today using a food analogy, how would you plate this meal? Oh, man. <laughs> I am in Texas, all right. Don't say, yeah, we gotta be careful. You know, queso, um, taco. So, so what I, actually the way that I would, think about it is, so if, if we can understand that there are a number of different racial inequities in, in health and criminal legal system and the environment and in, 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 in wealth, unemployment, um, and I think what's happening right now is literally, can you imagine if, uh, you know, you had, there was a friend of yours who told you to come over to their home. Oh, I'm telling the story. Uh, <laughs> and we're like, yeah, you know, I want to cook you, uh, a, you know, an incredibly 
a healthy meal. You know, I've noticed that you haven't really been eating that healthy, and I know you've been having some health problems. So you're like, all right, cool. Like, you're going to cook for me, and it's going to be healthy, and it's going to be good. So you get over there, and, and they, they, they tell you, oh, yeah, I made this incredible salad for you. And, 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 and it's like a whole bunch of stuff that's in the salad. And you're like, all right, you know, let's see what they put in the salad. Hope it's just not lettuce. So they plate it, and there's no vegetables. It's like burger, it's like <laughs> burger chips, pieces of hot dogs, uh, you know, pieces of chicken, pieces of steak, but they call it a salad. And they tell you it's good for you. And, and they tell you it's good for the nation. And, you, you, but, and, and then you almost feel bad. You, you like, got to eat it. Like, you came over there. They spent all that time. Right? I'm mentioning that. The reason why I'm, I'm sort of using that as an analogy yeah. is because we're literally living in a nation of widespread racial inequity. And we're being consistently told that all this inequity is good for us. Mm. Mm. We're liter it's literally harming us each and every day in our communities and people as we consume it. And the more it harms us, the more they tell us it's good for us. And then the people who are feeding it are also telling us they care about us, mm -hmm. right? And that this is going to make the nation better and even great again. Mm. There you go. I think we have time maybe for one or two more. Haven't got the hook off the stage. Um, let's, okay, this is a good one for, for the TikTokers out there. Uh, if, if an idea is important but complicated, what is the process to break it down to a point of understanding that it can be acted on in this 30 second TikTok world? <laughs> <laughs> what you think? Well, we, you know, we're, we're on TikTok, we're growing, follow us, but we're not posting every day. Um, for us, it's, yeah, I mean, it's very well-researched and sometimes scripted because you only have 30 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, and maybe it's a visual. So I think it's, it's really that secret sauce combination of um, how it visually looks, like is there a person who's compelling or who's just you know, looking at me and telling me about this and explaining it to me? Or is there another visual that's compelling? Does this make any sense? How long is this gonna go on? Um, is this somebody I trust? I think having a trusted narrator, a trusted source um, is also uh, really important to, to capture people because we know trust is broken, um, especially with the media. And um, you know, it's kind of like, what would you, how would you explain this to your friend? How would you explain this to your mom? And would you share this video with somebody? Would you post this on your IG stories? And just kind of like, kind of going through a little checklist, but it does start with legit research or reporting, maybe just to get a slice of something into the world. Yeah, and I would just add that when an idea is complicated, we should not think that we need to quote, dumb it down, right? Everyday people are just as brilliant as people with PhDs. And the, what we should do is seeking to like clarify. And, and typically when we're thinking about clarifying, we should be thinking about expressing the complications in language that people use. And so literally, it's, trans, it's almost like a translation. And it's interesting this question came up after the previous question is because one of the ways in which we can sort of translate complicated ideas for everyday people is through analogies. Yeah. Right? Because analogies are baked in complexity. Mm. <laughs> right? You know, when, 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 you know Tupac, when Tupac said trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, there's so much complexity Got packed, yeah. you know, into those words. Right? Or, or when Malcolm X would talk about, he would distinguish the, quote, uh, liberal foxes from the conservative wolves mm. in, in talking to black people yeah. uh, about the ways in which they both relate to black communities. People understand, you don't have to explain the difference between a, a fox 
and a wolf, <laughs> right? So there's so much already packed into it. And so I think when you don't have that much time, analogies can actually be quite effective. Yeah. Well, lastly, um, and thank you all so much for being here. I, this last question, I want to end on this top one because I think we do want to leave you all with something um, that you can share and that you can take into the world. You know, this question is, uh, I feel like I know this person. Um, name is familiar. Dupe. <laughs> what are the top three? Shout out to Dupe. <laughs> Shout out to Dupe. <laughs> what are the top three or more components of social impact stories that ignite audiences? So I think, you know, say something, be unapologetic, you know, have a perspective, have a point of view that is not watered down could be one aspect of that. What do you, get? What do you think? I would say for the story, if particularly if it's a nonfiction story, to be research-based or evidence-based, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean when you tell the story, uh, you give it as a lecture, <laughs> so to speak. But, and so there's a way to tell a story that is evidence and research-based but it's still sort of accessible. I think that, that, yeah. that moves people. And, and you know, another thing I would say is using your own personal story to explain a larger story, right? And, 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 and that's where, of course, your own knowledge about your own lived experience and your own expertise about your own lived experience can partner with research yeah. about what millions of people are facing, so that you can convey what you're facing, com almost comparing and contrasting you know, what you're facing with, with what other people are facing, so that then people can see themselves in you and even not see themselves you know, in you, uh, which can also, I think, ignite audiences. Yeah. And I think, again, going back to the medium as the message and how you're delivering that message, I'm thinking about a health equity video series we have that it's actually a travel show. Think about how you watch travel shows and there, or, or you, you have your travel guidebook and they don't have certain <laughs> communities, uh, smaller communities, communities of color that are maybe you know, off the beaten path listed. So we, we're, we're developing this series that is about bringing out examples and bringing out these communities and these community storytellers and urban historians who are really the heart of the community leading you, um, giving you that history and you know, maybe it's the history of disinvestment, but it's also, asset framed, it's looking forward. It's, we're not just talking about how run down MLK Boulevard is. We're actually talking about the people here changing it and changing the boulevard. You're not hearing about them, you're seeing the same things. So I think um, the medium as the message is also something we wanna leave people with. And anything else, Ibram, for this masterclass? What, what's your last goodbye for our South By audience here, five seconds? Well, I, I would just say, I just want to congratulate Amber uh, for her leadership of the Emancipator. And, and I want to also <laughs> uh, you know, I also want to congratulate anyone in this room who is a part of an organization or even sort of personally who is sort of using the power of story you know, to transform our society. We will win, y'all, okay? All right, well, thank you all so much. It's so a pleasure to be here. <laughs>